So this is the third week of our DIY containers. So I'm conscious of the fact that we've been drifting from pure flower arranging through to a little bit of a craft element, but always putting some flowers in at the end. And that's reflecting the fact that um, under quarantine that we are restricted on going out and buying flowers. And, and if you're like me, and um, actually I don't think any of you are, I think you've all got beautiful gardens, but I don't have a lot of flowers at home. So the few stems I've got, I need to make the most of them. And the way of doing that is the knack of displaying just a few flowers, but creating maximum impact. So today's project I did say was going to be about um, um, a bag of flour and corks. So I will show you my finished product and then I will go step by step of what we are going to create. So what I have made is all very Pinterest beautiful and I think possibly out of all the projects I've made in this short three week session that this is my favourite. So you'll have to let me know in the chat button whether you like this as well. And I should have said as well, do make sure that you use the chat button if you want to ask questions as we go. And I will open up. Good morning, Sue. We've made a quick, quick start without you. Um, leave your questions there if you want to chip in as I'm going through it, if things aren't clear enough for you. But otherwise I will open up the discussion um, just before the end of the session. So yes, it's play, it's it's flower, flower with a U, not with a W, and um, and corks. So I don't know about you. Actually, I don't drink anymore, so I don't know how old these corks are. But I do like saving a champagne cork. So it's not necessarily champagne. My brother-in-law likes the German beer that has a cork in it, Carver Prosecco, what have you. So I have a big bucket of these corks. And I normally bring them out at Christmas time and I possibly add them into Christmas table arrangements or put them on my dories. So I've had a bucket of these and I've been thinking, what could I do with them? And the answer is I'm using them to make little legs on plant risers, R-I-S-E-R, -E a riser, that I can put my pot plants on or put jam jars of flowers on. So without further ado, um, that is what I have made. So it's a little table with legs made out of corks. So I'm expecting a round of applause. So I use plain flour, Joan. I don't know whether it matters. Uh, no, I will say plain flour because you don't want it rising. It's definitely plain. Um, Joan is saying she doesn't drink either. Where can she get the corks from? I will look online and see whether you can buy corks. But another substitute would be if you have any doorknobs or draw knobs. Can you imagine that? You know, the, the, the door on a, the knobs on a bedside table, something like that. They don't have to be as small as this. And it may be that you've got something in your, you know, your odds and ends box, your, your, your um, the drawer, kitchen drawer or your DIY toolbox, possibly a good substitute would be, you know, a proper wooden drawer knob door, or door knob or any other small block of wood. So if you're able to find a block of wood, you could always slice up another block of wood and give yourself some square feet. So rather fortuitously, the pub, yes, Sue's so saying, Go to the nearest pub, Joan, <laughs> and ask for corks there. Or I guess you could ask friends and family, couldn't you, to save, save them up for you. Um, but there, there are alternatives. I just like the fact it's lifted off the table slightly. And I will say, because I was so pleased with this, we did have it out on our table as like a little condiments rack. So we had, um, oh, we would have fish and chips on a Friday. So I put our um, salt and vinegar and... I have salad cream on my chips and tomato sauce, so it did make quite a nice um, condiments table. So that is where the corks have come in. As I, as I was saying that I was fortunate enough to find this bit of wood on one of my daily walks because I've been searching for bits of wood to put things on with my cricket machine to use as that. And that was just an absolute lucky find. But I have to since discovered that in our garden shed, we've got a huge trunk of offcuts of wood. So it's possible that if you're into DIY, you may well find you've got offcuts of wood. 
and um, and Jane's saying she would possibly go into a pub. <laughs> Good for you, Jane. But it may be perhaps you've got an old chopping board or um, offcuts of wood. I've said that already. Um, so just something else you could repurpose or to think about doing another day when you happen to come across a piece of wood. Now, the next one I've got to show you is where the, the, um, the balls came in, the, the, the flower. I have made salt dough balls and I've put this on a slice of silver birch. Now, this may, might be another option for you because slices of wood are very fashionable at the moment for weddings. <clears throat> and they're used as centerpieces. So instead of having a single centerpiece, you might have two or three mini displays making up one big centerpiece. And I think probably you're going to find more luck and I will be able to find you a link to slices of wood. And of course, if you've got a garden or you know, a, you know a, a, um, an arboriculturist, you may well find that you can get someone to slice a bit of wood for you anyway. So this looks a tiny bit like a Simnel cake, look like that. Um, and I've made the, um, the balls out of the salt dough. So I, am, I will send you the recipe with the, um, with the email I'll send you afterwards. But it's probably the kind of thing, possibly if you've had you know, young children running around, that you may well have made this mix before. Traditionally, you would have seen it and you would have rolled it out and made shapes, possibly something to put on the Christmas tree or Easter. You've made you know, egg shaped motifs out of it. So I have made loads of dough balls and I have put a hole through them all. So I have taken, it was 250 grams of plain flour, 125 grams of salt, you mix up the dry ingredients and then you dribble in 125 mils of water and then you mix it around, it's like, exactly like making pastry and then you bring it together in your hands and you try and you know, pack it into a pastry looking thing. And I did find I had more success when I put it in the fridge to settle. I think they say that about pastries, don't they? That you, you need to stop handling it and let it relax a little bit. And then I um, put it out onto a, a, a board and I chopped bits off. And the bits I chopped off were probably about the size of my tip of my thumb there. So the first ones I made, I think they're a little bit too big. Um, they're probably about the size of a cherry. I did, so I did make another batch and these are a tiny bit smaller so you can see there and I would say it's one of these jobs like everything I show you to do don't rush it it does actually take quite a long time to sit there and take a small bit of dough roll it in your hands and then to create the holes how well you can see the holes there I took a skewer and just pushed the skewer through my dough one way and then I pushed it back the other way because you, you, you end up with a nice entry hole and a messy exit hole so I did go both ways and then I put that on a lined baking tray and they um, cook at the lowest setting of your oven for three hours and I will say mine took longer than three hours so every so often I took them out and gave them a squeeze it's like testing a cake if they still got a bit of um, squidge in them, they're not ready. But by putting the hole in, that should reduce your cooking time a little bit because it is just a solid dense. I'm not offering any guarantees as to how long these will last before they'll start to decay. But I guess if you cook them properly, you could even varnish them. And then some of them didn't quite go right. I don't know whether you can see that. I split that one because I think perhaps my pastry was a bit dry, and as I was rolling, it was falling apart. So um, it's trial and error, but it does take quite a long time from having made your batch of dough to then um, roll them all up. And I've ended up with quite a nice display of them. These, I did make two batches. So I made one of the whole 250 grams of, of flour. And then because I thought actually these are too big, I made another set, but I used half the quantity of flour to make the small ones. So um, I would say that um, possibly play around with half quantities first. But I think they look quite nice in my little bonbon bowl. So I'm having those as a decorative item around the house. Of course, you could shortcut all this if you've actually got some wooden beads. And you may find that if you, you, know, you might have some in your craft stash, they don't all have to match. You could have mismatching wooden beads around it. You could have colorful beads, but I think they do need to be sort of marble size to make an effect around the edge. And you could paint beads if you've got them already. 
and um, I'm losing my train of thought. Anyway, you could use real wooden bees if you've got them. They were fashionable, that's what I was coming around to. There's this whole sort of farmhouse style, boho style is very fashionable. And when you're all allowed back out to craft shops, you will probably find wooden beads quite easily. So uh, having made these beads, I then strung them up into a necklace and effectively glued them to the top. But before I got there, I had a DIY lesson from my husband. I'm not sure I should. Do. Well, I went to the expert. I, I handy with most tools, but I thought I'll cut out the middleman. You know, instead of me spending ages and ages trying to um, work out the best way of doing it, I asked my husband what he thought and what he advised. So he's actually been very helpful to me. So credit to him. So I started off with my corks. And then all my corks, they weren't all the same. These ones I chose because they were the corks from sparkling wine. So they've got this bulbous bit on the end. It was that bulbous bit that I really liked. So what I did is I lined my corks up on a surface and then measured how much I wanted to cut off. So some of them I have cut off at that lip. But because the bulbous bit was different in each one, sometimes I did come up a bit higher. So do measure before you cut. And then I um, drilled holes in it. So a power drill is handy. I should say as well, I fixed these in with one and a half inch screws. So you need to make sure that you don't want your screw to point, poke through the bottom of your um, bit of wood. So you need to sort of do a bit of a measuring game, really. If that's the, I should do it the other way up. If that's going to be the leg and you know your screw is one and a half inches or whatever size you happen to be, you just need to make sure you have allowed enough depth in your cork and in the depth of the wood, if that makes sense. You don't want the, the screws coming through on the top edge. So do measure before you cut. And if you're going through your, um, your, uh, your toolbox and you've got mismatched screws, it doesn't matter, but you will need to be careful to measure individually. I know sometimes you can still get into a, a production line and then you come to put it together and discover everything was, was mismatched. And then with a power drill, I then made um, a guide hole into the top of the cork for where my screw is going to go. So it's much easier to screw a screw in if you've already got a hole to go down in. And my husband's advice was to make sure you go slowly and to make sure you go vertically because you don't want to be skewing off at the end. I then changed the bit on the drill to a counter sink bit. So that's a bit technical, ladies. Do you think we're up to it? And that is to give a sort of well at the top of the screw, at the top of the cork, in order that the head of the screw is submerged. So you can see there that the, the screw is hidden. You can just see it's recessed a tiny bit. And that is with the counter, sit, counter sink bit of the drill the bit being the technical word. And if you don't have a counter sink bit, you can use a bigger um, drill bit to make a hole, but just make sure you're not drilling all the way down. You're only drilling to scoop out a little bit in the top of your cork in order to allow the screw to be buried down. The next thing I did, I did do the drilling first, and then I um, cut off along my marked line. And I discovered, we have, apparently we, we have this, saw that looks a bit like a carving knife, a serrated carving knife. And my husband suggested that if you didn't have one of those, a bread knife, because the, the cork is quite soft, a bread knife would work, although of course you run your own risk that you're blunting your, your, um, your bread knife. You then end up with little bits like this, so little truncated bits of cork. And the next job is to screw in, as I've already done, again, I'm not quite sure you can see, that's me. I then part screwed in the screws and I will tell you that there's just a tiny bit there that is poking out. So did the same to all three. I put three feet on my round disc, but four on my rectangular block. And then I drilled holes in, my, um, in the block. So measuring in where I wanted them to go. So again, measuring to make sure it's correct. So I've got three holes marked here and then when you've part screwed in your cork screw you line that up with the hole that you have just made and then magically it will 
fit together. So I would say, I mean, I'm not, I'm okay with power tools, but I would say that I'm certainly not the DIYer in our house. But this I found was a re really quite straightforward project. So you can see that in the few minutes I took there, you know, I've now got a, a leg on the top and you would just go round and add in the other legs. So I really liked that as it was, because it's silver birch and it's quite decorative. I didn't do anything more to that. I didn't paint it, although I did paint the other one and I'll show you how I did that in a moment. And then what I did was to make the little charm, the little detail around the edge. And for that, I started off with making a tassel. So let me know in the comments, ladies, whether you have made, oh, Swayze, you've joined us. Oh, it's lovely to see you. I haven't, you haven't got your video on, but I've just seen, so I've just seen that you've joined us. And um, it's a shame I can't see you, Swayze, because we've never met in real life. I've never heard your voice. Oh, she's at the garage, so you're incognito. So I'm making a tassel. So do you know how to make tassels? I'm getting the car repaired, oh, bad luck. So um, I'm using my hand, I've got some cord here. And again, this is just what I had to hand. It is, a, I think it's, um, it's cotton, I think it's crochet yarn, so it's quite thin. And I've chosen this because number one, I can thread a needle through it. And number two, that needle will fit through the holes in my beads. So I have made this in reverse. You might have thought I strung it together first, but I've actually made the um, tassel first. So assuming you don't know how to make tassels, I'm wrapping the yarn around my hand. Then I'm going to throw that on the floor many, many, many times. And it depends how many times you go around as to how thick and chunky your tassel will be. You will probably want to go around a few more times than me because other, you, know, you want something nice and chunky. So cut it off and then cut yourself off a decent length and then cut yourself off a shorter length. So I'm guessing you know how to do this. So, but I will, so I, I will whisk through. I take my really long piece of cord, fold it in half and then with a looped end, I'm threading that through the hole. And then I'm going to thread through, you can't, it's a sort of the technique we use when we tie a posy. So I've made a loop and I've pushed the cut ends through the loop. So you can see it's starting to look tassel-like, but the tassel's got a little head on it. So I take my other piece of cord, the shorter one, and I wrap that around a few times and then I tie a knot. So I need to put that down on the table so I can tie it. Oh, I've just I've just had a thought, ladies. I thought I was going being really organised and prepping, and um, because I can't see very well, I can't thread my needle. <laughs> I'm sure we're all in the same boat. Oh, please say we're all in the same boat. And then what I've done is I cut through the loops. I didn't really talk you through that. I cut through the loops, and then I've just cut them cleanly at the bottom. So I've got a really pretty tassel. And then what I did was separated out the ends. Let's see if I can thread my needle. See, look, proof I had prepped ahead, but I didn't use that. Let's see if I can thread this needle live on TV. So here we go. At the moment, it's concentration on my face. Oh, under pressure. Ha ha ha, look at that. So I've taken one of the threads around my tassel. Look, you could be making necklaces. And then with my beads, thread them on. And this is why you need to test that your needle will take your thread and your, will, be, will pass through the holes that you've made in your beads. So I've got a mixture here. In fact, I will be going really boho with a mix of the small and the larger beads. So you go on like that. So imagine that I've made that, and then with the other end, once I'm happy with the length, I put about 12 beads on mine, and I think there'll be a few more on the, on the one there. If you then put your needle in the other side, and you thread it down that way round as well, does that make sense to you? So you go all the way around to create a loop, and then you go all the way around the other way. If I demonstrate on this one here, so I made the tassel first and I threaded my beads on all the way around like that, took the needle off, re-threaded the needle on the 
other half of the, the yarn and then went in that way round and then tied a knot off at the end. I just felt that um, it means I've got two strands of yarn holding the necklace together. And I thought it means that you don't end, you're not tying off all the time. So if you make the tassel and tie that off, and then you attach, you attach your beads onto the necklace and tie it off. And then you've got to attach the tassel to the necklace bit and tie it off by kind of making it all in one go, starting with the decorative bit that you think would be at the end, but at the beginning, you've got less fixing points and that's why I did it. Um, but of course, you do it the way you want to do it. And of course, you don't need to have a tassel either. So effectively, I have made a, you know, a bracelet or a necklace to put on these. And then I have laid it on the top of my um, little plinth. And because I didn't want it falling off, I've then gone in with my hot glue gun and very carefully, I just lifted up each bead, squirted the glue in, pushed the bead down, lifted up the next one, squirted the glue in, pushed it down and went like that all the way around the edge. But you don't have to attach it if you don't want to. It's entirely up to you. It's all these extra little bits of component that fit together and you decide what it is that you want to do. So when you have finished, see I'm, what I might do here on this one, I might actually, we've got lots of beads, I might string it up and make a tassel for the other end and have it as a piece of cord I could snake through my arrangement and the arrangement is jam jars and flowers so it's cutting and plonking. So I particularly like creating these little risers or plinths because it means that you've got somewhere to set your flowers in and we quite often talk about that in flower arrangements about creating impact and having um, um, grouping things so you may decide for instance I've got here you know a jar of a jam jar of a bottle of flowers you know, all very pretty on its own but sometimes if you've got that off on a table somewhere it can look a little bit lost and it almost needs to be grounded somewhere grouped somewhere but without looking too cluttered and the advantage as well as putting on a plinth means that if you need to clear the table or you need to dust if you're into dusting ladies that you just pick the whole lot off and walk away you don't have to go there's one bottle there and one bottle there so it's very simplest you use it as a plinth and it just um, keeps everything together like that. So that is the idea. But before I go and show you, you'll notice that I've got a fabulous paint effect on here. And I am so pleased with this. So that's the block of wood underneath. So what I did here, I sanded this. I've left the silver birch just raw as it came. I was quite pleased that the colour of the salt balls matched the, um, the colour of the silver birch plinth. But this here, I have wiped the paint on and then wiped the paint off. So I have used um, just acrylic craft paint in titanium white. Has anybody been watching Bob Ross on um, great, uh, BBC4? He loves using titanium white. So go and look at that at seven o'clock of an evening. I squirted some out into a bowl to use at the weekend and you need so little paint that I've saved what I could because I couldn't get it back in the jar. So because I don't want to waste anything, I'm saving the paint. I've got um, a floral cloth here, it's just a J cloth. And what you do, and I'd be interested to know whether you've ever done this technique before, because my natural inclination was to get my paintbrush out and then think I've got a, you know, the fiddle and faddle of painting a paintbrush. So I am dipping my finger in the rag into the dish of paint and it's almost as if I'm polishing. Do you remember the old-fashioned ways of polishing with beeswax? I'm not a great cleaner for this and then I'm on the underside here you just rub it on. I cannot tell you how satisfying this is and then you rub it back off again and it's giving me a really light look. It's almost as if I, I'm going to turn it around so I keep catching that splinter. Um, it's like you're giving it a lime wash effect, a water, water washed, um, limed effect. Can't quite find the word there. So I'm going up and down following the grain. And then if I've got any sort of lumpy bits, I am bringing them out. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm not entirely convinced you can pick that up on the camera very well. But that is how I did 
the, the, the finished look and I, I think it worked really, really well and hardly needs any paint at all. If I'd used a brush, it would have been heavier and you would have, the, um, the grain would have been hidden. So this is a great way of getting some coverage, but you can still see the grain. I'm wondering whether when I do that, can I convince you it looks sort of marble-like? I'm not quite sure about that, but it's got a nice texture to it. And then I went around the edges. That went really well on the side, but I will say if you're going to do this, where you've got the cut edge of the wood, because you're going against the smooth grain, it was slightly harder to do. And when I came to rub it, my cloth was snagging a little bit. So you, you will need to put a bit of care into that as you do that. So the next thing to do is just to start to put things together. Oh, it's the decal as well. You know, I've shown you that speech to ignore the arrangements we've done this time. So just, you know, just in case you don't know, these are fresh cut flowers. Of course, I have to label everything to say that they are fresh cut flowers and start to put it together. So I thought you could use it just like that. Um, I quite like this round one. I've got um, a nice plant pot. So it could be that you're making little stands for your plant pots at home. And as we know, when we were flower arranging, it's all about the space. It's not always about the flowers. It's about creating the space. So if, for instance, I put the jam jar flat on the table. Yeah, it looks quite pretty, doesn't it? Not bad at all. But if I lift the jam jar up, the, the arrangement has now become this big. So it's the same amount of flowers. It has a more imposing status. So that's a really good way of lifting things up. And those of you who've been to conventional flower classes before, you perhaps use the plastic pots and the flower foam and you sit it down and it looks very, you know, it looks beautiful, but it is flat to the table. But I'd always suggest if you're doing that, get yourself, you know, a, a, a dish or a glass, some sort of pedestal or upturned plant pot and lift it up. And by raising it, you've got all that space underneath the arrangement, which becomes part of the overall whole. So I could set these up as two separate entities, but I quite fancied layering them up. So easy to do layer it up it looks pretty so you could have this out you know all the time if you wanted to it doesn't have to have the flowers in and then you you play around about how you want to do things and all I've done here is literally um a cotton a cotton plonk I'm not actually skillfully arranging flowers this was about the the crafting activity the thing I have done here though whereas in previous weeks I've used the reds and purples in my garden I've gone for whites so I just thought it um just to be something a little bit different and to acknowledge the fact that the seasons are changing in the garden. So I've got um, a sweet william in there with a little pink trim on it. And this is a convolvulus, which I think is related to the um, bindweed family. You probably remember that as children popping those out. Granny pops out of her bed, we used to say. So put them in there and I could you know, set that up there. And then I've got my little jars, which featured, I think last week as well. So we've got oxide daisies, the head of Great hyacinths making another comeback. This was a Cranesville geranium with a lovely purple head, which I've knocked off between moving the flowers from the living room through to here. And if I lean over behind you, I've got a couple more jars. So that is a flower of clematis, which is lasting quite well as a cut flower. So that was a little bit closed yesterday, but has come out. And then I've got some pale calendula, which is the marigold daisy. You're probably used to seeing that as a bright orange, but this is quite a peachy colour. And you put it all together and you could fiddle and faddle and faddle and fiddle until you've got what you really want. And then I've used my extra charm, or well, I didn't glue down, to drape in between. And that seems to be the way things are going. Now I'm going to rush now and take you all off mute.